Today we're going to build a 20 minute version of a Baldur's Gate style dice roller. We'll be working with a second camera, 3D objects on the canvas, calculating triangles of a mesh, the centers and normals, and we'll be building an editor tool so that we can set values to all these sides. And of course, we'll be displaying the final value on the canvas. Lots of ground to cover in Unity today, so let's get into it. I'm not gonna build the UI on the fly, but I do wanna cover all the important points and gotchas. The dice roller is its own canvas with its own layer that I've called dice, and all of its children that need to be visible to the camera also need to be on this layer. So the walls of my invisible box that keeps my dice on the board could be on this layer, uh, but they don't have to be because they're not going to be visible and I'm going to keep the mesh renderer turned off. I'll just turn it on here so you can see what's inside. It's just a little box that keeps everything in range and the background is just something I made in Photoshop for the video thumbnail. So beyond that, on the canvas, I've got two text mesh pro fields that are just going to hold a label for say roll or whatever and then another one that'll show the results of our roll. So for now, I've just got some filler text there. We'll be using that in a minute. Let's jump over to this new camera I've made just for this. Now it's orthographic. It has a really far clipping plane setting because I've blown up the objects really big. That's because we're going to be using 3D objects here, in particular this dice. Now the container that's wrapping all of my objects here is also scaled up a little bit, but it's the dice itself that's quite big. So this one I've scaled up to 12 because I kind of looked the best to me, but uh, you might want to play with it. And when you're showing 3D objects on a canvas, it's going to start out really small. So if you can't see something, check your clipping plane distance. Make sure you're far enough away and make sure that the size of the objects you're trying to show is a reasonable size. Now, the dice itself is just a plain 3D model. It has a mesh renderer, a mesh collider on it, a rigid body. There's no surprises here. If we take a closer look at the D20 here, I just have two scripts on them and I've filled them up with references for now because I don't want to waste time in the video trying to find sound effects and whatnot. So when it comes to showing 3D objects on a camera in Unity, often it's the camera that's the gotcha. You want to make sure it's on the same layer as the canvas. So that's the dice layer. It's orthographic. The far clipping plane is far enough that you can see things. And of course, we have a culling mask here that is only going to show things that are on the dice layer. Now you want to go over to your main camera too and remove the dice layer from its culling mask. A good way to test is just set up your camera and your canvas with all the settings that you want and just have one or two objects on it and make sure you can see it in game view. Now, if you're back here in scene view, once you have this all configured, you can actually drag this just about anywhere you want. And so it doesn't have to be over with your other UI stuff. It doesn't have to be in your world. It can be off in some far corner. And you can see if you drag it around, it's not going to move on your canvas because of the way it's set up. It's worth noting too that I have this camera set at a higher priority than my main camera. Maybe that's enough UI. Let's start writing some code. Let's take a quick look at the data structure for the sides of our dice. Each side will know about the center position of the side, the normal vector coming out of the side, and a value. Now today we're using integers, but this could be a string or anything else you can imagine. We're going to serialize this class so we can edit it in Unity later. Now the sides will be contained in another class that we can encapsulate behavior. We'll store all the sides in an array, and then we're going to move on to building the actual roller. We'll be adding behavior to this class as we need it. So I've got a basic class set up here with all my references because I've already chosen some start values, audio, and FX. We'll talk about each of these as they get used, but a little lower here we have a countdown timer. Now this is a class we made from a previous project and it's going to control how long the dice can actually roll for. It has events that run on start and on stop. We're going to make use of those. So I'll include this with the repository. Let's jump back over to the roller. So we've got a couple other fields here. The origin position is going to be our start position. We're going to set the dice back or try to get back to that spot every time we roll. Current velocity is going to be used for a smooth damp when we're moving the dice back to the center. And we'll have a Boolean for finalize, which means it's time to wrap it up and get the value. Let's add a really basic on mouse up method that will check to see if our timer's already running, meaning the dice is already in motion. If it isn't running yet, we'll start the timer. I'll define a new countdown timer with a max duration. Now let's make use of those timer events. When the timer starts, let's call a method that will start the roll. 
When it stops, let's set our Boolean flag to be true so that we can start ending the roll. So in our update method, we need to pass in delta time into our timer. So every tick, we're going to pass that in. But also, let's see if the finalized variable has been triggered. And if so, we can start running another method that will start moving our dice back to the middle if it's off on the side somewhere. Now, there's going to be a few occasions where we actually have to reset the dice state and just make sure that everything's starting from zero. So why don't we make a little helper that'll just do that? Okay, so let's start performing our initial roll. So we can start by having a little sanity check and resetting our dice state. Let's also set the result text just to be empty while the dice is rolling around. Now with that done, let's just determine a direction to send our dice off into so we can grab a position, figure out a direction based on that position and where we are now, and then we'll just add some force in that direction. And we will also add some torque. And we can just use the inside unit sphere method for that and we'll just get it spinning in some random direction. Now let's define our other method to move the dice towards the center when the roll is done and it's off in the corner. So this method is called every update as long as the finalized boolean is true. In here we can use the vector3 smooth damp method to move it towards the center. Now I'm going to use an extension method here just to check if we are within point one of our origin position, in which case that's close enough, let's finalize the roll. Let's take a look at this extension method really quick. All this is doing is getting the square magnitude of the distance and making sure it's within the square of the range that we pass in. Okay, back to our finalizing the roll. This is going to be really straightforward. Let's just make sure the timer is stopped, the finalize is set to false, and we can reset our dice state. Well, we also need to get the value of the dice at that position, and we're going to work on that part next. We're going to make a method on the dice sides class called getMatch. Let's output that result to the console and also set it as our result text. So let's come back over to the dice sides class and start writing some more code. I'm going to define a constant that will determine how close to being to the normal we would say that something is an exact match. So if the dice was pointing straight up, how close do we have to be to one? I'll make a helper method that'll grab any side given an index. Let's make one more helper method that will return a rotation that represents how much and in what manner we would have to rotate this specific dice in order to make it face upwards. So we can do that by getting the world normal of a given side, and we can compare that with vector3.up. Then we can multiply that by the transform.rotation. These methods that return quaternions can be hard to understand, but we're going to be using this later in our editor tool so that we can just flip a dice right up to any given side that we want so we can see what value is on it. So let's start working on the logic for getting a match. Now get match should return the value of whichever dice is actually facing up. Let's get the inverse transform of the up vector direction from the dice's current transform. This means that we have a reference vector pointing to what the dice considers to be upwards. Next, we'll go for a loop over all of the sides. The loop is where the magic happens. For every side of the dice, it's going to calculate the dot product of our dice side's normal vector with our local upward direction. So the dot product is a measure of how parallel two vectors are. The closer to one, the more parallel they are. Now afterwards, it's going to check if the dot product exceeds our constant value. And if it does, that means that this is close enough to be an exact match. And we're just going to return that value and not loop anymore. Finally, if we weren't able to find an exact match at all, we'll just return whichever one was closest. But if for whatever reason it's still null at this point, which it really shouldn't be, we'll just return minus one as a default error value. That's actually pretty much all the code we need to make this work, but I'm going to add one more thing in our dice roller, and that is when we go into a collision, if our angular velocity has sufficiently dropped to a certain point during the collision, we might as well just start finalizing the roll at that point. And I think if we can adjust this value a little bit, it'll make the dice look like it hit the wall and then just rolls right back to the middle. It'll probably take some tweaking, but we can set the finalize to be true and then it should start wrapping things up and we'll get the result. Now, beyond that, I have all these sound effects and visual effects. So I'm just going to run through here really quick and just add some different things. So when we start the roll, what I'm going to do is I've got a shake clip that sounds kind of like the Baldur's Gate one. We'll just put it on a loop and it'll play the whole time until the roll is over. So when we have a collision, I'm also going to play a little impact clip and I have a particle effect I want to play. I'm actually going to create a little method here. Because this is in canvas space, I'm going to make the particle effects bigger on the fly. Now this, these first little sparks, they can be just small. So I'll, 
I'll pass in a 1f for that on the size. Here, let's just define a quick method here. We'll pass in the fx, we'll pass in the point where we should spawn them and the size. And Copilot knows what I want here, so we'll go with that. We can just destroy these little sparks after one second. I'll move this helper method down to the bottom. I'm going to use it again when we finalize the role to play some success particles. And at this point, we'll turn the looping off and stop the audio, and we'll just play a one shot of the success sound, and then we'll spawn the success particles, and they can be bigger for sure. And uh, then we'll let, make them last a little bit longer too, maybe three, maybe three seconds. Okay, that's about everything we need to do a little test here. I'm going to recompile, hit play, and give it a click. So. Looks pretty good. Goes back to the center, even if it's off in a corner. Let's try it again. So, getting minus ones every time, but you know, we expected that. And I'll give it one more. So I might have to tweak the value to make it go back after a collision on the wall, but uh, we can play with that. So far, so good. So now we need a way to link up whatever numbers on the texture to an actual value we can use in our game. Let's start working on our editor tool so that we can set these values for every side. We're going to be manipulating the array property that's part of the dice sides class. We're going to keep a reference to it. Let's get that reference by using the find property method on our serialized object here. Now we called it sides in the class, so we'll just fill that in. And now we can start writing our inspector. So every inspector needs the on inspector GUI. We're not going to call the base class here because we're just going to have a custom one. So first of all, let's call the update method on our serialized object. That'll make sure that our object is up to date before we start doing anything. So I'll put a placeholder here. We're going to show all of the values in a nice little display. When we're done with that, we're going to apply any modified properties. And we're also going to create a little button that will go over our mesh and figure out what all the sides are for us. So we'll put a dummy method in there. And I think actually we will fill that one out first. So let's start working on our calculate sides method. Let's start by getting a reference to the object that we're actually targeting right now. And what we're going to do is grab the mesh from this object. So let's write a little helper that will take care of that for us. So the most likely scenario here is that our dice has a mesh collider on it. And if so, let's grab it. If it's not null, then we can say, well, we can just pull the mesh right out of there because it has a property on it, shared mesh. We could also get this from the mesh filter if there was no mesh collider. Let's just assume that one of those two situations is true and that we're going to get a reference to the mesh. So after this, we can start composing a list of all the sides that we find on this. Now to do that, we're going to need a special algorithm just to go through all of the triangles on this mesh. So let's come down here and just declare a new method that will return a list of dice side objects. And as we're cruising through every point in this mesh and calculating all the triangles, we can fill this list up. We'll bring the list back and then we'll populate our side with the information we got for each one here. Let's declare a new list to hold our results. We can get all of the triangles out of the mesh using the mesh get triangles method. We can also get all of the vertices and all of the normals. Now, Copilot already has a really good idea of what to do here. Basically, all triangles, of course, have three points. So in our array that we got back when we called get triangles, this is just a list of points three by three. Each of these points represents an index in the vertices array. So now we can loop over all of these points uh, going up in increments of three and grab all three vector threes that represent the points of each triangle. Using that, we can calculate the normal using cross product and we can calculate the center point by adding all of them together and dividing by three. Now I'm going to simplify this a little bit by inlighting a bunch of variables. So all we're really going to do is create a new dice side object and add it to our results object every time with the center and the normal. And then when we're done all that, all we really have to do is just return this list. We can come back up into our calculate sides and there's a few different ways we can go about this, but we want to inject all this data into our serialized property. So now that we've found all those sides, we can declare a new array to hold these in on our serialized object, which we've already grabbed here using the target. So we've declared our array to be the same size as the amount of sides that we found. Let's loop over all of them. Each loop will grab that property from the array and we will set the 
center and we'll set the normal of it. When we're done, we need to apply the modified properties. Now, earlier we had written a method that will return us the quaternion we need to use to turn everything towards the up vector. So why don't we grab that one for index number zero and we can just set that as our rotation for this. That should get us a nice start. So with this done, we just have one more thing to do, and that is we're going to show all of these values so that as we're going through each side, we can see what the value is in the inspector and we can make sure that it has the correct value that we want. Let's make a method to do that. We're gonna to have to loop over all of the sides and have a little entry there that we can edit. Let's add a label at the top. We can just call it dice editor. We can make it bold maybe. And then I'll indent a little bit. After that, we can write our loop and we'll just have a small method that we can call for each one because they're all going to be exactly the same just for a different index. So we can pass in the index number. When the loop is over, we can just change the indent level back out. So each entry really just needs to show us what the value is for that side. And I also want to have a little button that we can click and it'll flip that side of the dice to be right to the top so we can see exactly which one we're working on. So to do that, let's grab the value out. We'll begin horizontal because we're gonna put this in a row across. We'll have a property field that'll have the value we can change. We can have a label with it like side number one all the way through 20. And then let's add a button in this horizontal area too. We can just label it as show. And whenever someone clicks the show button, let's run a little method here. We can call it rotate dice to side. So rotate dice to side, all we have to do there is get the world rotation for that index and we can rotate the entire dice to be in that direction and repaint the scene. Okay, almost ready to test, but I made a couple little mistakes. I forgot to end my horizontal here. And over here where I created a new array on the serialized object, I should have called the update method just to make sure. And one more thing is on my quaternion method, I actually, meant to go from the world normal to vector up and not the other way around. Hey, you get some funny behavior if that was the wrong way. Okay, let's test. So if I come over here into the inspector now and I've got my D20 selected and I click the button, watch what happens. It's found 20 sides. If I click show on any of these, it's going to flip up to the first one. So the first one is four and I can set the value in here now because I can see it and 14, then we've got 18, and I can just go down the list and make sure that they're all correct. Now that you could do the same thing if these were symbols or strings or anything, right? But for now, we're just using integers, and I'm gonna speed this up, of course, because it's very boring, but I'll just go through all of them and make sure that they're all correct. And then we can actually test and see if we can get values that aren't negative one. So with that all done, we're ready to go. And let's see, I guess just click play. So now we should get the correct value for the dice. So 18, yep, there we go. Looks good. Let's do a few more tests. 16, yep, great. How about one more? Four, very nice. Okay, perfect. It's doing exactly what I want. I could probably improve the collision and the speed speed at which it goes back towards the middle, it would look a little more natural. I think I'm going to keep playing with it. If you feel like you've got a good handle on dice logic now, but you need more, you want to throw more dice, you want different kinds of dice, check out this asset. It's really good. I've had it for a long time. I, I love it. Otherwise, I'm going to link some videos up here for you to check out and I'll see you there.